Welcome to Biz Help For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. But there always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here's your host, Candy Messer. Hello and welcome to Biz Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found the information on last week's show, Deep Dive Into Marketing on a Budget, informative. If you are unable to join us and would like to listen to the show, links can be found on our YouTube and Facebook pages, as well as multiple favorite podcast platforms. If you'd like to receive notifications on when our podcasts have been uploaded, please like and subscribe. If there are topics you find beneficial or questions you have, please feel free to reach out to me at media at abandp.com. Now let's learn a little bit about our guest today. Coach Sean is an online weight loss coach, as well as a mentor to online coaches and consultants. He considers himself to be anti-guru in a culture of fake online personas pretending to be super successful. Instead of flashing Rolexes and rented cars, Coach John focuses on teaching simple, practical, scalable solutions to building online businesses that can stand the test of time. He's written and created three mini courses and two full length courses to take someone from an idea to a fully functioning, scalable coaching business in 12 weeks or less. So Jonathan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Well, I would love to learn a little bit more about you and how you even began in this coaching industry before I ask you some other questions specifically on this topic. Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, I, I, I don't think I graduated from university thinking I wanted to be an online nutrition coach. And I've, I've got quite a varied background. I've been uh, a nanotechnology researcher. I've been a marine engineer in the Navy, uh, a globetrotting English teacher, a power line technician, a heavy equipment operator in the oil patch, <laughs> I've wow. a nutrition and supplement <laughs> store, so bricks and mortar business, um, as well as I had a light oil field hauling company. Um, and then ultimately ended up uh, coaching online. It actually came about as a result of a previous business failure. Mm. Um, so the bricks and mortar supplement store that we had, one of the other things that we offered was this nutrition coaching. And it kind of it kind of meshed well together because of course, as a part of a nutrition plan, we could also recommend certain supplements that would benefit the individual. And so it kept people coming to the store, but also provided us with an additional revenue stream. Um, but ultimately that business uh, failed. It was, it was a really um, unhealthy business partnership um, there's a lot of, um, let's say, lurid details that I'll, I'll gloss over, but it ended up costing <laughs> me my, my, my life savings. And so wow. you go, okay, when you've lost everything, uh, what, what do you do? <laughs> and uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to build something that somebody can't take away from me because this is actually the second business I've had that failed. Uh, so you mm -hmm. think like, what, what is it? <laughs> I, I share that because I think it's important as entrepreneurs and, and business owners to understand that like failure is almost inevitable when we when you enter the business world. There's certain factors that come about that really are very often outside of our control, but it, it shouldn't it shouldn't dissuade us from from dipping our toes into this. And so. I decided I was going to build an online business and I didn't really know what I was doing. And I, I, why I call myself an anti-guru is because like I, I went around and looking for some coaching, some guidance, some mentorship and so on. And there's just, there's a lot of people running the same script out there. They're promising you they're going to get you to six figures. They flash on all the money they're making and they show you snippets of this person or this person saying how much money they made and so on and so forth. Um, they run you through the same sales process. It's like they're all in the same mastermind. And, uh, you know, I so I'd I'd uh, sort of get burned a few times by mentors um, before I realized, you know, like there's a lot of people out there that don't have integrity. Um, they'll tell you what you want to hear. Once they have your credit card information, you're kind of screwed. Uh, right. They'll throw you. They'll throw into a group coaching program with 60 other coaches. You get on these two-hour Zoom calls where you might get one question answered because they're all trying to just basically get as many credit card numbers as they can so they can brag about the numbers and they're not actually worried about helping people. So I kind of built my business from scratch. I've got an engineer's brain. And I really, I really focused on making it like lean and efficient, I like to call it. So I, I didn't want it to take, you know, hundreds of hours a month to run this business as a solopreneur. And I figured out there's, we have a lot of technology we can use to kind of leverage uh, our, our time. And then I kind of inadvertently became a mentor because some people just asked me, would you teach me how you built your business? And so I thought, well, if I'm going to teach you, I might as well write a course about it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of started this, this process of mentoring. And so 
I don't even run a website because I just do everything by word of mouth. I help somebody, they tell other coaches about it, and then people, you know, kind of come my way. Um, and that that's that's sort of how it started. Perfect. I mean, I think sometimes organically things just happen, right? You know, you find an idea or someone tells you like, oh, can you help X, Y, Z? I mean, even that's how I got into business. I never intended to be a business owner. <laughs> and yeah. Someone asked me for help and, you know, <laughs> here I am all these years later. So I think too, we kind of learn things as we go along. We have our failures. Like if we don't fail, we're not trying, right? We're, we're going to fail yeah. somewhere most likely, you know? And I think that's why I like having this podcast too, is just helping people by giving them information and so they can learn from those of us who've kind of been there and done that and you know help them be successful so if you had to go back and do it again from the beginning like how would you have even begun your coaching business yeah man well i would i like to say that like if i knew now or if i I knew then what i know now (laughs) it'd probably Mm -hmm. look a lot different there'd be a lot less in, in one sense, there might be a lot less mistakes, but truthfully, I think I just make different mistakes and end up learning from mm-hmm. them. But I would say, uh, start with an idea and be publicly transparent about it. So starting a business, sometimes it's really daunting. And one of the pressures we feel is like, maybe we're afraid to tell our friends and family what we do. We don't want to spam our friends on social media and things like that. Or maybe we just have a kind of a, an unhealthy relationship with money. So we're kind of, we're kind of afraid mm-hmm. of it. Um, uncomfortable with it, that kind of thing. And so we're afraid to talk about what it is that we do. But I say, look, you're only really spamming people if you are like annoying them and you're not <laughs> providing anything of value or or that's helpful. And probably some right. of this comes from the, the pressure of like the, say, the multi-level marketing type industry where it's like just DM, in other words, direct message as many people right. as possible, get someone onto this webinar and so on and so forth, get them signed up. And, you know, it's not a business model that I like. I'm not against people doing it, but it's not, I'm not really a fan of that business model. And so I would say there's probably like four, if I could distill it down to four um, like crucial steps to get something off the ground. Uh, the first one I would say, uh, especially in the world of coaching, is practice what you preach. So mm. it's easier to tell somebody how to do a backflip than to learn how to do a backflip yourself. Hey. So I felt like it was really important for me to run a successful nutrition coaching business first. I needed to be able to prove that not only could I teach people, because you could just read a textbook, I guess. You could try and, I don't know, rip <laughs> off other people's information and, and, and teach them, so to speak. But I wanted to prove that I could do this first before I would ever consider teaching anybody else. Because that's a part of being in, in what I call being in an integrity. Um, like, you could also say maybe, like, live what you teach. I, I don't mean in, like, the... You know those nine? I don't know if you remember like those nine ninety nine steak knife commercials. Like, and if you act right. now, I mean, oh my god, right. you're gonna throw in another. Like, no, nobody wants that sort of infomercial type. But, but just genuinely, authentically enthusiastic or passionate about what you do, I think really matters. So, mm-hmm. live what you teach. I think really is really really important. I think the second thing is um, share free help. So. I think there's sometimes there's this fear, like back in the day, it used to be like, oh, I have my super secret special email list. Um, I share information there that you won't find anywhere else and so on and so forth. But the truth is, I mean, we live in the age of Google. Uh, hey. I do I do have an email newsletter, but I think it's people are on it because they enjoy how I, how I share information, my particular take on things. They're interested in me, the human being. And so if you, if you try to pretend that like... Um, information is the problem you're losing because it, we don't live we live in the information age it's implementation where the struggle is and so share content that genuinely helps people uh because if you can imagine this if somebody reads your free content and they start taking action on what you share and they start getting results guess what's going to happen they're going to go oh maybe they'll go back to this person and get more help so you can be right. genuinely helpful and as by using like your unique voice your life experience. You can present information in, in an interesting way. Like I have my own journey of losing over a hundred pounds and it, it was, mm. you know, so, so let's say you, you kind of, you've shared the idea that you're, you're going to, you're going to get this business off the ground. You're now just starting to put out content that just genuinely helps people. You're not pitching, you're not spamming. You're like, just let me, let me demonstrate to you because you need some degree of social proof. And the first degree of social proof is let me provide you with information that genuinely helps. And then I would say, <laughs> ask for beta test clients. So I'd be like super transparent about this process. I, I would explain why I'm looking for beta testers, right? And so uh, when you offer a discount to someone, it, it, let's say let's say it's going to be paid, but you're going to offer a discount because they are a beta tester. 
you want to be clear that you're offering that discount in exchange for something, not just because, oh, my service isn't so good because I'm starting out, so I just, I got a discount. No, no, no. Right. You are exchanging a discount in order to get honest feedback about the process and a testimonial if they have a good experience. So test clients are really, really powerful because they, they help us smooth out the systems. They kind of work out the kinks. And maybe the last step is share your success stories. So in the beginning, your success story might only be your own. Uh, maybe it's a friend that you helped for free or you had a couple of, of beta testers. The thing with success stories is it doesn't necessarily have to be like a before after photo, right? Mm -hmm. It could simply be an after photo of someone enjoying a better life. Uh, and maybe I, I should just take one step back and say like, if you're gonna run a beta test, um, you, you kind of wanna ask each, cause you wanna be deliberate about it, right? You wanna ask people specific questions. How did this program help you? What would you say to someone who is considering joining the program? And what did you enjoy about working with me in the program? That okay. kind of thing, right? So that's how I'd, I'd probably, you know, from the, from the ground up, I, I'd start, if I had to start all over again, that's kind of what I do. Right. And those are all great tips. And I think, like you said, when you were saying people might be afraid of spamming their friends or family, I think, like you said, if you just say, Hey, this is what I'm doing, you know, are you interested in some of the information? You know, a lot of them would probably say yes, because they want to help you too. And then, you know, if, they don't want it at that point. They can opt out, right? If it's a newsletter, they can opt out or they For can sure. let you know or they don't have to follow you anymore. So it's not like you have to feel that you're forcing it down. That's another thing, like you said, if someone's sending messages directly to someone's inbox or something. But I think yeah. it doesn't hurt to let people know what you're doing. But I think sometimes on the opposite side, people might be afraid to say something because, well, if I fail, nobody will know. <laughs> right? right, yeah, you know? yeah, that's, that's true, actually. Um, and I would think here, here's another thing that maybe we don't consider. Uh, let's just say your, your Uncle Joe, the, maybe they're not going to be like your ideal client. But if they're mm -hmm. aware of what you do and they, they bump into someone in a coffee shop in a conversation and go, oh, hey, you know what? Um, my, you know, niece, whatever, nephew has, does this actually. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you'd like to, you know, so y we, we trust like personal referrals more than say an ad that we see on Facebook. Yes. And so just if people are, it's not to say that, I mean, we, we could talk about referrals a little bit down the road, but it's not to say that referrals are going to be the only source of business. But if someone knows what you do and is aware of like you're good, you're passionate and so on, you're going to, you're going to have a degree of relevance in their mind. And when, if they ever bump into someone in conversation, they start talking about it, for example, weight loss or health, people might talk about me um, because they're aware of what I do. So instead of treating people as like they're either buy from me or they won't, treat everybody like a potential source of marketing just by being aware of what you do. Right. And word of mouth is important, but what about like other types of marketing and, you know, in terms of people always talk about organic marketing and things too. So what is your opinion about that? Organic marketing? Well, maybe we could say marketing in general, you're going to kind of pay in one of two ways. So you're going to pay with time or you're going to pay with money. And sometimes it's a mixture of both. There might be this sense that organic marketing is dead because on social media platforms in particular, where a lot of organic marketing takes place, they've definitely cracked down on people. They really have cracked down on organic reach. So we want to we want to recognize that it is more difficult. The online space also is getting more saturated, especially after COVID and people move to a more online environment. And so what's really necessary here is to be able to craft a unique message. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be novel and ground like something that's never been thought about before. But you want you want to have something that's unique to you. Your voice as a human like becomes really really important. Your story, that part of your content becomes really important. And so, I, I teach an organic strategy that I call ACE, which stands for authority, connection, and engagement. And each one of those pieces kind of has a role in in a successful organic marketing strategy. Because here's the thing, uh, you could be really really amazing at what you do, but if you can't communicate that. Uh, mm -hmm. The, the people aren't going to be reaching out. And so maybe I could just say, I'll, I'll give you kind of a quick nutshell version of, of what I mean when I say authority, connection, and engagement. And so authority, let's say, in the, I'll use a nutrition example. It's not saying, you know, carrots help night fishing. Um, nobody cares, <laughs> right? Like, yeah, people might see me as a nutrition expert if I could explain, like, you know, the retinol in, 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 in carrots helps with, you know, okay, cool. But very few people about, uh, will care about that because it's not like a lack of carrots in their diet. It's like the glaring problem. Now, if I write about my experience of losing and keeping off over 100 pounds, well, that positions me as an authority, but people can see an element of their themselves in that story. I would like to lose a, a significant amount of weight. This person has lost a significant amount. That actually 
having the lived experience is much more likely to position me as an authority than than posting information that we could basically Google. Right. So that's kind of, that's kind of what I mean when I say authority, and and that's why, for example, I I didn't step into the mentorship space until I'd proven that I know how to run a successful business. Because you get a lot of you know DMs from so, so-called gurus that are like twenty something years old, being like, "I'm going to help you scale to six figures in twelve weeks." I'm like, <laughs> "I've been in the business game for a while, kid." Um, you know, but connection is really about people hire people they like. They hire coaches that they feel are human and and relatable, and so that's really what connection content is about. Uh, you know, are you a parent? Um, you might show pictures enjoying yourself, you know, time with your kids. Uh, are you a dog lover or a cat lover, um, outdoor enthusiast? Whatever it is that you are passionate about outside of your professional practice, let them see that part of your life. For example, I love board games. Um, I'm a board game nerd. I don't play a lot of video games, but I'm a board game nerd. And mm -hmm. so maybe I'll share some of my passion for, for board games. And that gives another kind of unique point of connection. So yeah, I'm, I'm an expert in nutrition and psychology, for example, in the weight loss field. But I also like board games. And so people will, if, they, if they're a fan of board games, maybe they're more likely to connect with me. Um, <laughs> and then kind of the engagement piece is, well, we could call it like gaming the algorithm just a little bit. And what it is, we want to get, we want to put out some content that will get people engaging with our profile. Uh, so it can be, it's like the simple impulsive content. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Um, we just had Canadian Thanksgiving. So it's like, do you prefer ham or turkey at Thanksgiving? Um, you know, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? So a lot of mine are going to be connected to nutrition and food because uh, that's, that's I, I run a nutrition coaching business. That sort of idea where people can just be entertained. They can, you know, show me your favorite GIF, something like that, where people are now engaging and commenting on your profile and you can reply to those comments. And, and it just, it means that if someone engages, they're more likely to see other content you produce. Because if you only produced uh, like authority content, you will see lower engagement. It's not that people don't read it, but they're, they don't always react and engage with that type of content. So by mixing in these other parts, you're getting people more uh, more connected to you in a more well-rounded way. Mm -hmm. Right. So what would be the dark side of the mentorship and the guru industry? I know you've said you are different than a lot of the ones out there. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So there's a lot of, like, you know, I, I said earlier, it's easier to teach a backflip than to learn how to do a backflip. And there's a lot of people who I kind of think couldn't hack it as an actual, let's say, coach or professional in their own realm. And they thought it would be easier money to tell other people what to do instead of do it themselves. And they feel like they can justify charging a higher price because we will kind of see greater value in me teaching you how to make money versus me teaching you how to lose weight. But the problem is... They, they all like so they all run the same script where it's, it's about getting you on the hype train, getting you on a sales call. Once they have your credit card information, they kind of have you by the tail. And it's a lot of people sort of peddling the same stories. Like I remember being in a mm -hmm. conversation with a guy and he was like, uh, I said, look, I've been in this game for a while. I've even I've worked for a mentorship company, I've been a mindset coach. So I've been behind the scenes inside these companies. I know how this all I know how the game works. So I said, just tell me what your price is. And he says 10K. So 10,000 US dollars for, for a three month program. And uh, I said, cool. Uh, I appreciate you sharing that with me. Um, he said, I had to raise my price in order to help people get better results. <laughs> so I was like, really? Really? Yes, there is a degree of correlation between what people are able to pay and sort of because money, we could say, is kind of a reflection of people's commitment to the process right. or belief in the process. But there's kind of an upper limit to that. And when you are now like, pushing people to, he said, you know, if you can't find the money, you, you get resourceful. And it's like, maybe I just don't want to invest the money in you. <laughs> That's more like what it is. <laughs> Excuse me. So it's like, um, they're, they're sort of drinking the same Kool-Aid where it's all about like, you know, money is abundant. Money is all around you. The universe is filled with abundant money. Just stand in the stream and, you know, interrupt the flow of it. And uh, all of this sort of esoteric, intangible, like kind of BS. There is something to mindset. I agree. You, you, you know, being confident in what you do um, or having confidence in the process you're going to be a part of means you're more likely to take action. Right. But they're all peddling the same sort of woo-woo, um, almost cult-like sort of mentality, um, selling the dream that it's just going to be easy making money and they all want to push the same high-ticket um, way of doing things. And we could talk about high-ticket business and the ups and the pros and the cons of something like that as well. But that's kind of... so. You kind of know when someone slides into your DMs and it's like, you right. know, so tell, tell me about what you do. 
you know, are, are you really where you want to be in life? And, you know, that kind of thing. You kind of know where that conversation is going. And it's like, I'm just going to have a real conversation with people, talk to them like a human being, get a, get, get a sense of where they're at, where they'd like to get to, and if I can genuinely help them. Right. And I think for those who are listening to this thinking like, yes, I want to be a coach or I want to be a more successful coach. Maybe they've been doing it for a while and they're looking at some of those people and saying, oh, I need to be charging, you know, more. I need to be doing more so I can really get out there and letting them know, like, don't compare yourself, right? Just be you and whatever works for those that are your ideal clients, right? You you don't want to chase people away because the price is out of their range, right? So I guess you know, just helping them understand that, like give them any tips on how to figure that part out maybe. Yeah. So in terms of there's, there's often pieces of the puzzle that get missed. So let's say, for example, you see this coach talking about how they're charging, you know, $6,000 to run a three month coaching program. And you go, Oh man, I want to be able to do that. Well, the truth is most people are never going to be able to drop $6,000 in a three month coaching program. So (laughs) what you don't know is that person maybe lives in the Bay area in California and their father's a venture capitalist and their sister runs a tech company and they're connected to all these high flying tech people who are making, you know, 600, 800,000 or a million bucks a year and $6,000 is a drop in the bucket for them. (laughs) What if you live in, I don't know, West Virginia and the average income there is $34,000 a year. You want to try to convince someone to spend one sixth of their income on three months of coaching and then try and sell them on the dream of abundance. Like (laughs) it's like realistically, that's not going to work. And so this is kind of where I would say like systems and scaling come in, in terms of figuring out, okay, this is what my sort of clientele, because even if you excuse me, even if you're online, you're very likely going to still see a lot of your clients come from your local geographic region, because mm-hmm. well, it sounds exciting to be like, oh, I'm online. I could have clients anywhere in the world. It's like, if I have a client in India, there's a 12 hour time difference. That's really inconvenient for trying to connect. Right. Like it just, it's impractical. So chances are you're going to have mostly people sort of in a similar zip code, similar time zone, that kind of thing, just from a practicality standpoint. And so I would say get to know your market and charge charge a fair price for what you do. But it, it's like, do you want to spend more time on sales calls trying to get credit card numbers or more time actually doing what you're passionate about? Right. That that's another thing because like I've I've done high ticket I've done low ticket I've done sort of a, a mid range price and that's kind of what I've settled on really is kind of a mid range price point um, for that reason um, and maybe I could say like I think the the six figure goal is overrated mm-hmm. one because it's a little bit more difficult than people realize to like you, you could have a month where you make over ten thousand dollars revenue yes okay. But to sustainably and consistently do that month after month, year after year is more difficult than people realize. So when you see these people bragging about their numbers, it's like there's a, there's actually quite a bit of number fudging going on because mm-hmm. there's also a big difference between, say, recurring revenue and lump sum payments. And also right. you have to factor in the time to deliver the service. So in my industry, for example, the average coaching income is around $4,200 per month which brings you to around 40, 47 to 51 thousand dollars per year, which is actually a pretty good income. So the the kind of the guru and mentorship space would lead you to believe that everyone is like crushing it and they're <laughs> nailing 10K months, month after month and so on. When in reality, that actually represents about uh, like less than 5% of the coaching space. So there's, there's a big difference between having a month where you bring in $10,000 revenue and a business that brings in over $100,000 a year. So there's a lot of extrapolation that happens in the numbers as well. And so I would say for me in business, it became a lot more about freedom than income because, so let's just say I could make seventy to $80,000 a year working 25 hours a week. That's amazing. And it's a lot less hustle in a sense because you gotta, you gotta figure out, like I was spending a lot of time, say messaging people, I was spending a lot of time pumping out content and so on. I was getting away from coaching and away from living my life. And so there's other aspects of business or life, I think, that are more important than just trying to be able to brag about a certain dollar value coming into your bank account. Right, right. Yeah, it comes down to balance too, and that's not always easy, but, uh, you know, and what your definition of success really is. And actually, I was asked this question recently about what I defined as success. And, you know, I, I looked at it from a different perspective uh, there was a few different things I've talked about, you know, there's business success and personal success and like relationships and things. But I asked, I said, I had gone to a conference once where this gentleman was talking about how successful his business was, uh, but he'd been divorced three times. 
And so I thought for myself, that is not for me. Like, I'm not going to have the most successful business, but have a marriage in shambles, you know? So, yeah, I mean, that was great if that was his definition. Um, so I think we each have to have that definition for ourselves too, is like, what do we want to define as success? And is it going to be only looking at money or is it looking at, like you said, you've got your freedom or time with family? Like, what is it that that is going to be your definition of success and and not just focusing on one thing? Yeah, like most days, I don't start my my business day before ten a.m. Mm. Um, forget forget the five a.m. club, you know, like that that's overrated too, really truthfully. Um, and it's because my I have a young son, and he's a bit of he's seven months old, and he's a bit of a night owl. Mm. And uh, so, I would rather. And in the mornings, like my mornings are mine and my family's. So <laughs> I'll, I'll get up in the morning. Um, I invest in myself first, which can be a hard thing to do. But you know, I. I when I say invest in myself, like, again, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound, um, uh, what's the word like ostentatious, but I mean, I do little things like I get up, I brush my teeth. Uh, I hop on my recumbent bike, go for like a 10 minute ride, get some blood flowing, get some oxygen flowing. Um, and then I actually have a cold shower every morning. Um, it's, you know, I don't think it has magical powers, but for me, it's really just about putting myself in an uncomfortable situation and being willing to be uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> It's a funny little, I call it my, like my little resilience test. Because if you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to be in business, you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have thoughts of wanting to escape, wanting to pull the chute, wanting to, you know, and so on. And so it's like, that's kind of my little resilience test. Um, and then it's, and I'll make breakfast for my wife. Um, we have morning snuggle time with, with my son. Um, we just have a little bit of quality time together as a family. And so I've, I've really like, I've nourished really my soul, could you say, mm -hmm. before I ever go and start giving of myself to other people, because whether it's in mentorship or nutrition coaching, I'm kind of in the business of service, like serving other people, helping them. And so I really have to fill my cup first. Otherwise, um, you know, I just, I'll end up burning out and just giving and giving and giving and ending up uh, burnt out. And so that's one of the cool things. Like I would call that success or mm -hmm. being able to take an hour and a half lunch break. Um, you know, uh, before this, I was just rolling around on the floor with my son, um, you know, just, just having some fun with him. So having that kind of freedom because I've built a business that allows me to do that. Right. That's important. So if someone is thinking of going into this field, coaching, you know, mentoring, whatever industry it really is though, what's the hardest part about having it as an online business? I would say probably the ability to to disconnect. So mm -hmm. let's say like if you have kind of a traditional nine to five or eight to four or whatever, something similar, you know, there is kind of the possibility of shutting off when you get home because kind of your work is done at the end of the day. And you, you don't actually, like you don't actually earn any more money by worrying about your job when you're at home. So you really get to, have, there's a clear delineation between like home and work and time, you know, time at work and time off. So there is... Because there is something like some people are just better off as employees that really works well for them in the online space. Could you say like th there's always more money that could be earned. Mm -hmm. So if you it can be really difficult to shut off and stop worrying about it. And the thing is, even having a successful business, like it doesn't mean that it's all just like a gravy train and everything like I, I there's a lot of responsibility being an entrepreneur, because if I step away from my business, like it is going to suffer. I do a little bit of outsourcing. I have some help in, in aspects of my business, but ultimately I'm still the heart of my business. And so when I step away, it it will, it will if I step away for too long, it will suffer. And so even mm -hmm. if we go on vacation, um, and I, I have kind of ways of setting things up for going on vacation, but there's probably, I'm probably gonna check in most days, you know, or I probably won't go more than two to three days without checking in on my business. And so, that's kind of a trade-off. If, you, if you're going to be in business, um, you're probably going to be more connected to it than you would a job. Mm -hmm. That's true. So I know we talked before about marketing and we talked about, you know, word of mouth and we've talked about some organic marketing and things like that too. Um, and I know social media isn't always what we hope it to be. You know, we don't yeah. get the reach that we hope. So what are some of the ways that business owners can grow their businesses without depending upon social media? Yeah, um, I, I like that's a good question. Why I like this one is, you know, like Facebook recently had their uh, like their, their sort of shutdown or whatever happened there. And uh, Facebook and Instagram and I think WhatsApp were offline. So it really kind of highlighted 
it highlighted the vulnerability that exists if if like the primary driver of your business is on social media. And so mm-hmm. I, I kind of think sometimes in the social media era, we got this idea that you need to be a big international presence or even like a national like scale kind of presence when most people could probably find all the clients they need in the nearest city to them, like truthfully mm-hmm. to, to fill out their business. And, you know, consider how you can become a local expert. You can connect, say, for example, in my field, connect with complementary healthcare providers, set up a referral system back and forth, like human, real human trusted connection. Because, hey, if people are going to a physiotherapist, they might want to talk about how to how to lose some weight because, hey, that, that'll give take some pressure off their knee. Um, right. Connect with like local publications, whether it's, you know, like the Coffee News or um, a local newspaper, offer to write a column for them, you know. Um, you can put on seminars for local businesses. You can join like local networking. You can even form a local business networking group. Like, you know, and some, like, truthfully, some are good and some are kind of a waste of time. So you do want to be picky about how you spend your time. But I think in a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is maybe think about being a big deal locally before ever right. worrying about being like this national or international superstar. Mm-hmm. And I think that helps too because often we're hearing, oh, you need to be on this platform or that platform. And then it can feel totally overwhelming, you know, to have to take the time to be on that and respond and all that. So I think that takes some of the pressure off, you know, of thinking, you know, if someone's starting a business, there's so many hats they have to wear anyway, they don't have enough free time to really be on social media. Well, in that note, I would probably say it's valuable to maybe pick one or two platforms that works for you and mm-hmm. make that your primary platform. So for me, I, I am a fan of Facebook um, and by extension, LinkedIn actually, because they, they are kind of versatile in the types of content that I can produce. So for example, I produce a sort of, I call it a, a live broadcast podcast. And so I do a podcast, um, but I, I broadcast it live. And so people can see it on you know YouTube, Twitter, Twitch, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, and so on. And they can actually interact with it in real time, which is kind of a neat thing. And of course, I can always take the audio afterwards and upload it to my to my podcast. But um, Facebook and LinkedIn, they allow me to pr- produce, like I can do visual content, I can do written content, I can do video content. Like there's, there's so many different aspects to it. Whereas say something like Instagram, which can be a fantastic platform, it's not really up my alley because it's primarily a a visual platform and an entertainment platform. So it's about either having really nice visual pictures or being able to create like humorous little clips and reels. I tend to be more of a long form content producer. That's why I'm in in the podcasting space. Um, So it's kind of like picking what works for you in that regard. Well, and we've heard before too, you know, it's not always about the number of people that you have following you, but how many people are engaged. Um, But then they're saying, well, if your numbers are too low, you're not getting the reach. So what is your opinion in terms of having a big audience? Um, I say it's overrated. (laughs) So here's an interesting thing. The number of businesses that I have, let's say, or that my friends have, they, they request me to like, let's say their Facebook business page. And most times I decline. And, and people would think, oh, my gosh, you're a jerk. You're not liking their page. And I go, well, no, actually, here's the issue. It's not relevant to me. It's not mm-hmm. something I'm interested in. It's not something I'm going to follow, engage, interact with. So I'm actually going to hurt them by liking their business because I'm going to be a dead follower. Mm-hmm. You want you want engagement, right? So a big audience, could it be helpful? Yes, if you have a simple like standalone offer that they can purchase. But the real challenge is it's very difficult to build a sense of community. So I remember like I was like working my tail off to try and like grow my audience. I was spending hours a day on social media content. I was researching all the right hashtags. I was commenting on the influencers posts and liking and so on. And this isn't to say those activities don't have merit. Like you're going to have to put in some legwork to get people aware that you exist, especially like nowadays in the online world. But a lot of the reason why I was doing it was because I thought that I needed a bigger audience in order to be successful. So I had this idea in my head that I couldn't succeed with a smaller, moderate sized audience. But a small audience, when you nurture that, can actually become a really highly engaged, intimate community. So building connections and relationships with an audience is easier when it's smaller because you can interact on a more individual level. And so I would say kind of like the more specific you get with regards to like your niche and who you serve, the more like targeted your message can be. And so rather than focusing on say vanity metrics, like likes and followers, you want to try to focus on growing um, like a more deeper, intimate connection with your audience. And so 
where that comes from is really becoming very, very clear about uh, what it is that we do. So when we talk about an offer, in a sense, business exists to solve a problem. And you kind of say to people, I'm going to help you get from point A to point B. I'm going to help you get from being a frustrated yo-yo dieter to losing the weight, keeping it off and living a life you love, that kind of thing. So if you really understand your audience, you can build this really, really engaged kind of intimate following. Yeah, that's great advice for those who feel, you know, oh, I have to have numbers, you know, we're always hearing about that. So it is really, really nice to hear. Just focus on those that you have that are really interested in what you have, because that's what's going to end up happening um, in terms of bringing in more business, because they'll refer to those that they know that need your service, right? Well, just picture this. If you're trying to build this big audience, you're, you're kind of saying to every follower, you're not that important to me. Mm-hmm. Now, how about you flip that around and reverse it? What about every follower you have? You said to them, you're important to me and I want to help you. They're much more likely to be interested in the content you produce if it's relevant to them and their problem right. than some big influencer who has 400,000 followers and gets a thousand comments on every post, but can never do any, like, good luck responding to all those comments. They can't. Right. So mm-hmm. treat every, every individual follower like your best client. Great advice. So again, with someone starting a new business or maybe, you know, they've started for a little bit of time, but they're still the sole owner doing everything and they're feeling completely overwhelmed with everything that has to be done. Like, what is your recommendation for the three top productivity hacks that have helped you in your business? Yeah. Uh, Number one, I would say this might sound counterintuitive, but stop looking for shortcuts to the hard or uncomfortable work. So there's a lot of stuff that we need to do that isn't all that much fun, especially starting out when we are wearing all the hats. So what happens is, you know, and I found myself doing this, busy work. Mm-hmm. So a lot of time being consumed, just doing stuff because I was trying to avoid doing something I didn't really want to do, frankly. And so a lot of work just kind of it, it, like it's not business that moves or sorry, it's not activity that moves my business forward, but it felt like I was doing something. Right. But it, like it really. So it, it's like you kind of have to maybe I could say by extension, become ruthless with your time management. So we, we all have a limited number of productive hours in the day. You want to figure out what are the activities that are actually generating some revenue for me? Um, and then we build our weekly calendar around those things. It, like time management is not about being a slave to a schedule. In my mind, it's actually about creating headspace. So what I know is I don't have to manage these tasks because in, in my head, because they're on paper. Um, so then I can, when I go to take on a task, I'm focused on that one task. For example, we're, we're doing this interview. I'm not worried about my clients. I know that later in my schedule, I have a specific block of time where I'm going to focus on engaging with my clients and supporting them. Right now, I don't have to worry about that because that's on my calendar. And then I would say the, the last one would be cut down on unnecessary complexity. <clears throat> and so there's a real temptation to want to make things um, flashier and more complicated than they need to be. But if you take a minimalist approach to setting up your business and you only add in like necessary complexity, when it it allows you to accomplish more in the same amount of time. So in the same way that we kind of become ruthless in our time management, we kind of become ruthless about how our business operates because complexity really, one thing is, is it creates the opportunities for things to break down and slow you down. And really, you only need a few key things to run a successful business, um, especially as like a, a solopreneur. And uh, so that's kind of, I mean, I have a mini course, I actually have a couple of, like you mentioned um, the mini courses that I have. So one of them is called uh, Launch Ready in 24 Hours. And that sounds like a bold thing to say, but really what I'm going to show people is here with, with completely freely available software in under 24 hours, because it takes a bit of time to make these accounts. You can basically, you can have the... I call it the granny flat. Uh, it's like a guest house. You have a basic business structure that you can you can use to support maybe five to 10 clients. That brings mm-hmm. revenue into your business. And now you're not like waiting until your full business is built before you, you start making money. You already right. have a revenue stream. And then from there, um, you know, I have what I call the 5C organic funnel. So it's how do you go from writing content to landing paying clients? What are the steps? What does that actually look like? So, and then um, the other mini course is called, um, I call it content that sells. So different categories of posts and I give examples of posts that I've written and and how they've brought me sales calls and revenue and so on. So how do you write these different categories of posts? Because I talked about like the ACE content strategy. 
Um, so all of those are like three little quick courses that basically get you up and running generating revenue. I was going to say uh, revenue generating either way. Um, and then we can get into like, how do we build now? How do we turn this into something a little bit bigger, a little bit more scalable where you can handle a larger volume of clients? And, and that's where we go into a little more detail because um, I approach building, building a full scale business, kind of like building a house. You have a foundation which is your offer, who you serve and why. So you're just getting really clear on that. Um, and I show you how to do market research and kind of read your clients' minds. Then you kind of have your digital infrastructure. That's like the skeleton of the frame of a house, you know? Um, then you have your finishing touches, which is kind of like that, you know, in a house, it's like the flooring and the paint and the trim. Well, this is kind of like the customer experience. So what is it like when they bump into your business, you know, to coming into your business, to being a client, to, so going from like awareness you exist to like revenue, retention, referrals, that kind of thing. Um, and then you have a housewarming party. So your business is built. Um, you want to let people know what you do. So how do you do that in like a non-spammy way? But as we touched on earlier, make people aware. And so... It's it's um I I like to break it down like that because it's not such a complicated process when it looks like that. And you were just talking about software that you've used before. So what is the most useful software that you have used that you can tell the listeners to maybe look into for themselves? Oh man, <laughs> so I mean I I have probably I've I've trimmed down the number of software programs I use because I was wading into the waters sort of unnecessary complexity. Um, because partly because I do try out and trial some of these things in order to see how well it integrates into my business. Does it work? What are the, what are the problems and so on? Cause I'm, I'm like a former scientist and analytical, uh, chemist. And so I, I, I do bits of research, but I would say something like Zapier, um, is some people call it Zapier. I call it Zapier cause they say Zapier makes you happier. Um, that's, that's their slogan. So I think they intended it to be pronounced Zapier. Um, but anyways, uh, it, when you, when you know how to work a software like that um, i would say it's freed up more time than any other program out there now I, I use a coaching software for managing my client roster called pt distinction i use um, an email software called active campaign to help manage my email but the cool thing is zapier now allows pt distinction and active campaign to talk to each other and so it allows <laughs> me to automate steps in the process whether that's the onboarding process or the coaching delivery process and uh, and that's what I show people how to do. I'm like, not not just use Zapier per se, but here's how you, as we break down the process of what, what it looks like when you work with a client, here's how you automate repetitive steps, um, which actually frees up more time to either spend time face to face with your clients, if that's what you want to do, or spend more time doing something else. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I would say, uh, it, again, in a big nutshell, that's, I'd say Zapier has really been helpful um, figuring how to how to make that work for me. Perfect. Well, I know we're coming to the end of the time that we have for the podcast today, and this has been great information. I'm sure there's more you even have to share, um, but I wanted to see if you have an offer that you would like to extend to the listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the funny thing is, because I run my mentorship only on word of mouth, uh, <laughs> I am going to put up a basic website at some point in time, because obviously I'm, I'm going to have to um, in order to connect with people. But I do offer people like a free business audit. Um, and that's just a 30 minute conversation. It's not even going to be a sales call. Um, it's actually just going to be, uh, let's let's break down your business. Let's figure out if if and where I can help you. If, you know, um, if after that, we decide there's some value in working together, we can have that conversation. And so, um, I use Calendly, so it's uh, calendly.com slash coachjohn, J-O-N, slash business dash audit. And we can put the link in the show notes, Perfect. but um, <laughs> yeah, um, I really, uh, it just, I'd be happy to um, chat with people about that. Um, and I, I can't think of the links off the top of my head, but I mean, maybe I'll put a couple of links, or we can put a couple of links in the show notes. Um, I've got a couple of YouTube walkthrough videos where I'll show you, for example, my cope strategy, create once, post everywhere, which is how to basically syndicate one piece of organic content. I can, I'll show people how to do that. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll throw a couple of things Perfect. in there for, for, for your audience and show them how to leverage their time a little more effectively. Sounds good. Yeah, if we don't already have those links, make sure we get them and I can include that with the description of the show and everything as well too. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So, but thank you so much, Jonathan, for being a guest on my show and sharing your expertise on this topic. I found it interesting and I'm sure the listeners will too. Well, thank you so much. It's been, it's been a real pleasure. I always enjoy these conversations.
So, and I do want to also thank the listener. I'm glad you were able to join us, and I hope you did find this topic interesting and that it helped answer some questions about building a scalable online business. If you have any additional questions, be sure to reach out to us at media at abandp.com, or of course, you can you know schedule an appointment with a link for uh, Jonathan through that Calendly link. Uh, and would you please share our show information with those you know? I'd greatly appreciate your support. I hope you can join us for next week's topic. And please remember you can connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And my website is abandp.com. And remember, you can find the podcast posted on multiple favorite podcast platforms, including Google, TuneIn, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for listening to Biz Help For You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next Tuesday. Have a terrific week.